Well, good afternoon. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ann Hislop from Stanford Medicine Children's Health, where she's a pediatric epileptologist and clinical associate professor of neurology and neurological sciences. The topic she will be discussing today is introduction to neuromodulation. Dr. Hislop. <laughs> All right, nice to meet you guys. We're gonna um, keep this casual. Um, Disclosures, just so you know, I'm not getting any reimbursement. I'm not being paid by any of the companies that make these devices. I don't have contracts with anyone, um, but I do work with all of them closely. Um, and then when we are looking at candidacy for a neuromodulation device, it really does depend on the patient, and you should be working with your providers to dis discuss whether or not one of these devices is a good fit. Um, and just as a reminder that you may hear over and over and over again, people that have failed two or more medications that are appropriately chosen and dose should really have a surgical evaluation. Not everybody is um, a candidate for a surgical curative resection, ablation, or disconnection, but some people may be very good candidates for neuromo neuromodulation, especially if the seizure focus is right next to an area of eloquence, meaning an area where you speak from or you, you hear from, you listen you know, you understand language, you see things. And so if we're super close to that area and we feel that taking that area out would cause damage to one of those functions, neuromodulation may be a really good option. Um, and then sometimes I have families that are saying, you know, I'm not ready to undergo surgery yet. I don't want to have a big resection. What can I do first and to give me more time or to give me some control while I'm thinking, considering something more um, permanent. And so neuromodulation can be actually a pretty good fit for families like that. So first I'm going to review the basics and then we'll go quickly through uh, each modulation. I only have 12 slides. So, but I really wanted you guys to be able to come up and touch all of the things, um, all of the different neuromodulation devices, and I'll go through them and kind of walk you through each of those. Um, but first, to talk about the basics. So neuromodulation, as I said, doesn't cure epilepsy. It actually works over time, so putting it in doesn't, Im it doesn't immediately start to pre uh, prevent seizures, but it actually prevents seizures uh, increasingly over time, over several years. And so uh, we also see positive effects on mood, attention, um, sometimes uh, even concentration, alertness. But we can see in some cases negative effects on mood. And so we screen patients very carefully and we kind of talk about what the risks are according to that patient before we choose a device that could potentially increase a mood problem. Every device consists of electrodes, wire connectors, a stimulator and a battery, and a lot of them have a recording capability. So the device implantation itself are generally pretty safe, um, very well tolerated. And then um, just so you know, VNS is approved to down to age four. Um, DBS and RNS are approved 18 and up, but we do use them in children already. Um, there's always a risk of worsening of seizures when one of these devices go in, but you would be surprised. It's actually pretty low. It's not something that we commonly see at all. Um, and then everybody asks, can I go through the scanners at the airport? <laughs> and so this is in my basic slide because this is a really valid question. And so everybody that has a device that's implanted just in medicine, not even just neurology, gets a card that allows them to bypass the scanner and just get the wand scanner um, done instead. Um, it doesn't damage the device, but it can kind of reset things or change it a little bit and to go through the scanner, and so we generally avoid it. But, And then all of these devices can be turned off, and they all can be removed if they're not working or someone feels that they don't want it anymore, except for the wire on the VNS that goes to the neck. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit more. So I'll start with VNS. So VNS was actually approved in 1997, so it's been out for a real long time, but several years ago, um, the age of indication or approval went down to um, four. And so what it is, is it's this small battery power device that sits in the left chest right here, and a, um, a electrode with an extension wire is tunneled up through the neck. And so there's an incision that's made here to be able to pull it through and then the neurosurgeon wraps the end of the electrode around the vagus nerve, not all the way, but just kind of cups it around that nerve. And so it, you, can't, you can kind of feel it under the skin, and if someone's particularly thin, you can kind of see it under the skin. 
but it is the newer devices. This is called a Centiva, is pretty small. And this one actually allows us to do a number of things that the old VNS is used to not. So when this goes in, we actually turn it on at our center in the OR and we actually program it to increase in stimulation and in strength of the neurostimulation that's given to the vagus nerve over time every two weeks for seven steps. And so, and that can be customized, but generally they have found a protocol that works really pretty well for everybody and is pretty well tolerated. So we generally set that up and then the patient goes home the next day and, and a lot of places um, we actually do as an outpatient procedure. And so if someone is a picker, we really just have to make sure that they cover the, the area of the insertion really well until the, the um, skin heals. And so, um, what this does is we can set the duration of the pulses, the strength of the pulses, and we can actually, with this new device, um, change what happens during the day and what happens during the night. Now, um, the, uh, w like when we change the parameters, um, we have a, a tablet. We hold the one over the device and we interrogate it and we ask the device, are you working properly? Everything looks good, functioning well, everything is working great and then with this new device we can actually see trends and what it thinks could be seizure based on heart rate and so this has um, the company has come up with an algorithm that doesn't necessarily give you a shock if you are uh, running but it has decided that when someone has a seizure there is an increase in heart rate many times not all the time uh, that really looks a certain way and so it actually will deliver an extra stimulus that the patient can't feel um, or hear and so and hopefully that will help to stop a seizure that has started alternatively you're given a magnet a couple magnets um, one of what you can wear it on a wristwatch or you can hold it you can you know attach it to a, a stroller or a wheelchair and so this is a way that you can help um, potentially abort a seizure by holding it over just kind of swiping it slowly over the the generator in the chest and so that can give an extra stimulation. Now, if you were to hold it over and keep it there, it gives an extra stimulation and then shuts the VNS off. You remove it, the VNS comes back on. And so I have patients that sing, patients that give speeches. And so sometimes they get a little bit of um, kind of vibra like a vibration quality in their voice when it turns on. And so before they sing or they do their speech, they'll put it over the, the chest and tape it there and so that it's not going off when they're doing that. Now we can adjust the settings so that you don't experience that type of vocal hoarseness or vibration, but some people it works really well at a certain strength and so we keep it up and then we kind of deal with that type of side effect. Um, so there are patients that have like breathing disorders and sleep and this the VNS can make it worse so if I have someone that has like obstructive sleep apnea I always do a sleep study before I put it in and a sleep study afterwards and sometimes when I'm adjusting it to see if it's if I'm exacerbating the the sleep apnea or not but it's not an absolute contra contraindication um, the battery is not something that you can recharge depending on the parameters it will last five to eight years and then the battery has to be changed. And the way I do it is sometimes after five to eight years of having a VNS and being on different medicines and dealing with seizures, you're like, is this, is this working? Is this doing something for me? I don't really know. And so I can tell when the battery is getting low and we're getting to the end of the life of the battery. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, if we're in a stable place, I'll turn it off and we'll wait a month or two and see if things get worse and if they do then um, we know okay we're going to replace the battery um, but most of the time we feel we look back and we say look we feel like this vns has taken away this type of seizure it's made these shorter it's made the post seizure time period a little bit shorter and uh, um, and so then we'll say okay we're just going to keep it in and we're going to keep replacing the battery and that is again an outpatient procedure where just this has changed now the the wire, if somebody says, I want the VNS out, it's not working for me, we take it out, but we leave the wire that is in the neck because the, the little electrode that is cupped around the vagus nerve actually kind of scars to the vagus nerve over time. It's actually more dangerous to try to pry it off and get it out, and so we, we just leave that in, and it doesn't cause any stimulation or any issues, but that's something to know um, going into it. Now, you can still get a brain MRI with this in. We prefer turning it off before you go in the scanner, uh, but it's something that a 
one of us has to do with the programmer. Okay, so responsive uh, neurostimulation. This is made by a company called Neuropace. It was approved for um, people ages 18 and up with focal seizures in 2013. Now, um, it is a neurostimulator that is implanted in the skull. So this is for patients where we think we know the seizure, where the seizure is coming from, but we cannot take out that area. So it might be in the area of speech production or in the area of vision. Um, or they may have more than one area and we don't want to take out both. And so what this does is it's all in the head, so it's all in the skull. An area this big is taken out of the skull and this is placed flat in the skull and so you can't see it and the hair falls over it, you can kind of feel it a little bit. Um, and then we have pre-identified areas where the seizures are coming from and the electrodes can be implanted around that area or in that area and attached to this, this battery slash stimulator, okay, and recorder. So we have a couple different types of electrodes. We have ones that kind of penetrate tissue and ones that lay on top of them. And so we decide which kind is best for which patient and exactly where they should go. And that's usually designed kind of based on an intracranial EEG that we may do beforehand. Now, um, this battery so this battery um, is also a recorder and so it's something that the patient can um, like you saw in the pictures they have their own wand at home a laptop and you can put it over and you actually download the EEG information from your brain onto the laptop and, and in the beginning I say do it daily um, and then every week upload go to your laptop upload it to your patient's site. Then I'm in the office and I can see all of their intracranial recordings. So I can see how well the device is working. And I have programmed the device to say, as soon as this seizure starts, and it looks like this in this area in these electrodes, I want you to give a little stimulation and stop that seizure. And so through the recording, I can see if that's working well enough, or if I need to tell it to um, stimulate sooner or stronger or less often or recognize one pattern over another and so these are all really super tailored to the patient and so this is something that we can we actually can use it over time to monitor two different brain areas and say look like 90 percent of your seizures were coming from this area and 10 percent were coming from this area let's reevaluate if we could take that area that the worst area out and so then we can lead to a resection. So this also allows us to do chronic recordings over long periods of time to help somebody make a better decision. Because you know, one week in a seizure unit often doesn't really tell the whole story. You're like, we got what we got, but like, do we didn't get all of them? And so that's something where this can be particularly helpful. Um, now, the most common adverse event is infection at the implant site. So there's different shampoos and things that are used initially. Once it's healed, it d generally does pretty pretty well. Um, sometimes people get paresthesias with this, so tingling in their, their hands or, or kind of on their skin, and so we adjust the parameters to minimize that. It's not typically a major problem. Um, there is a, a risk, of course, if you get hit in the head, leading, you, you know, may have a lead break or you may break the, the part that connects the, the uh, electrode to the generator and then we have to do a re little revision. But to revise that, oftentimes this is just a little uh, uh, surgery in the scalp and it doesn't go into a brain surgery um, depending on where the break is. So that's something that um, this is a, the only intracranial, um, fully intra, intracranial neuromodulation device that we currently have. Now the upkeep is a little bit more for this one. And so before we propose it, we always tell families what we would expect. You know, daily uploads for a while, uh, um, uploads onto the website once a week, and while we're making adjustments, and then we, could, we meet with the patient, and even before you come into the office, I can say, okay, look, you know, we're seeing all these seizures, and they're coming from this area, and my, my stimulation is going in 10 seconds too late, and so I kind of know what I need to do, but I, the next time you come in the office, I ask, like, what did you feel? How did this happen? What, you know, what do you remember? 
it, and with that, all that information, then we make those adjustments to make that work better for each individual patient. And so this requires a lot of like discussion and meeting, especially in the beginning. Um, now this battery is also not rechargeable. It will last again about five to eight years, depending on the patient and how we have the parameters set. Um, and so this one, you can also now, just recently we learned that you can get a, a brain MRI. Um, now one other thing that the Neuropace can do um, is it comes with a magnet to kind of trigger extra recordings. So it's always taking recordings throughout the day. It's always recording what it thinks is a seizure and it's able to record 10 seconds before and some time after. But when a patient is feeling something and they wanna know if that's a seizure, they can wave a magnet, it's a little donut shaped magnet over the, the generator and that kind of does an extra recording and they can say, hey, you know, I wondered, you know, that thing I felt on Tuesday around noon, was that a seizure? Did you pick that up? And so that's sometimes really helpful for us to identify like what is what. And the last one that I have examples of up here is the deep brain simulator. And again, this was approved in 2018 for people ages 18 and up with focal seizures. Um, now this one, the electrodes are placed in the brain, but they are always placed in a, in a part of the brain called the thalamus. We have a thalamus on both sides of the brain. It's really like if you drew a, like a, a, a line between here and here, it's at the intersection right there and so we have two little thalami on each sides of our brain and this is a area that is really like a train station for the whole brain so every like pathway kind of comes through here and so it's really widely connected um, to the entire brain and so what these electrodes are done is so these are stereotactically placed in a certain part of the thalamus which can be hard to target so the efficacy does depend on how good the surgeon is at like threading this needle um, and so and usually we place it on both sides one in each thalamus and then there are the the wires go down and into the chest to a recorder battery stimulator and so this stimulator is similar in function to the VNS, where it's kind of like a pacemaker. It's just turning on and off, and on and off. And we can adjust how long it turns on, how long it turns off, how strong the current is. Um, but it's not responding to um, any type of activity in the brain. It's just, it's just pacing on and off all the time. Now, um, more recently, we have seen people um, we have, we have actually, like with this new um, Percept, we're actually able to record some information, but we're still struggling with but what exactly to do with that information and how it could potentially help us. So um, now this is a stimulator that's been out for a long time. I mean, it was approved in 1996 for um, just like tremor and dystonia. So the safety is pretty well established. Um, even though it's approved only down to age 18, we, we use it in children for dystonia as well as uh, increasingly with um, epilepsy that we can't localize. We don't know where it's coming from or it seems like it's coming from several different areas. And so, and there are currently um, some more trials on stimulating the thalamus um, with different devices that we are watching closely. Now, again, with this one, we can see paresthesias. Um, same type of tingling of the skin or the fingers that we can adjust the um, stimulation for. Um, but this is the one where we have seen problems with memory issues and depression in some of the trials. Um, and so this is something, now this was only trialed so far in people who had uh, epilepsy in the temporal lobe, like in a specific area. And, and the way this was working, it really affected a, a network that is intimate in the networks having to do with depression. And so we don't know if it's really the location of where the stimulation was applied or the types of patients we used it in, but uh, we're going to learn that over time. Regardless, we always consider this when we're thinking about putting in a DBS for somebody for epilepsy, we consider their mood, if they have mood issues and a way to monitor somebody with, with mood issues. The upkeep, um, now this battery is rechargeable. And so with this battery, um, it comes with, uh, the patient actually gets a little like cell phone 
um, which they can work on and say, hey, okay, I wanna see how low is my battery. And if it's low, they are able to put a, a charging device over it and it's kind of in a little necklace that hangs here and, and recharges the battery. And sometimes we ask them, they have to do it every day or every few days, um, but they're able to kind of know how low the battery is getting. Regardless of that, it's still, um, the newer devices are lasting maybe eight years, um, but depending on the settings, it can actually last 15. So now they are a bit bigger. So this is the newest device, which is bigger. Um, now, just as an aside, uh, the VNS really started and it looked a lot like this, and they have really kind of gotten it down to much smaller, so we're hoping over the years maybe these DVS devices will also get a little bit smaller, so we'll see. Now with this one, um, with certain guidelines, you can get an MRI um, as well. Okay, and the last one that I'll talk about is um, one called chronic subthreshold cortical stimulation. It's called CSCS. Now this is kind of a combination of some of the others that I've talked about. This one is entering in clinical trials next year, and thankfully this is going to be <laughs> the first neuromodulation device that is going to seek approval down in childhood, like right from the get-go. And so um, we're hopeful that it can be very helpful for patients. Um, it is a, a device that, similar to Neuropace, sits on top of the brain area that we find in our pre-surgical evaluation to be the area causing seizures. So the electrodes sit on top of the cortex, on top of the brain surface, and it connects to a um, generator which is implanted in the chest. Now this generator, this, the way it's done is when someone comes in for their surgical evaluation and they have electrodes in the, in the brain to identify exactly where the seizures are coming from, we actually try stimulation parameters while they're implanted and we say, oh look, this one works because their activity in the brain looks better when we do this. When we apply this type of stimulation at this, this duration, at this pattern, with this strength, it seems to work really well. And the, the company has developed some biomarkers that allow them to kind of accept, uh, like, um, assess efficacy at that time rather than waiting five years or seven years for us to know is it working. And so that's one of the things that I find really exciting about this uh, potential about CSCS. Now, um, once the device is implanted, we can make further adjustments, of course, in the outpatient setting, but there is less upkeep because it is not something that requires uploading or downloading or anything like that, and it may be directed. Now, what we understand about this is not only is it applying that like direct current, a lot like that Neuropaste did, but it is probably also changing seizure networks in a more widespread pattern. And so it is something that may be helping us in two different ways. So it's something that I'm very excited about. Um, now, formal trials, like I said, are starting next year, but the case series that has come out um, so far has been has shown some really good efficacy really early on um, quoting about 57 to 99 percent seizure reduction in most patients and so they're seeing some really good now the real test will be those formal clinical trials and going through to see if this is something that's going to be borne out for everybody who is it best for um, and then what kinds of side effects are we going to see um, now this one doesn't tip this one has typically the side effects as we see in other patients um, implant site uh, infection can be a problem. Um, it's less likely to cause paresthesias. And so these are, these are kind of like the things that we are looking forward to in this patient. So to summarize, you have the VNS, goes around the vagus nerve in the neck, implanted in the chest, turns on and off over time, day and night, has a way to rescue, kind of like abort seizures with the magnet, potentially. Um, the RNS, all located in the head, Put on areas where we think that the seizures are starting can be put on more than one location if we think there are two seizure foci. Um, and it's all in the, in, in the cranium, requires some uploading and downloading on the, on the side of the patient. And the deep brain stimulator implanted in that little tiny part of the brain called the thalamus and um, in, on both sides. And then one generator is implanted in the chest. So um, that's all I have, but uh, my reminders to you are these don't cure epilepsy. These palliate epilepsy. 
they work over time, and so we can see improvements in seizure um, reduction up to 75% when we, when we reach that five-year, seven-year, nine-year mark. Um, and then other points that I didn't mention, in my opinion, the side effect for these, for neuromodulation, is actually favorable compared to many of our anti-seizure medicines. And so it's something that I have implanted patients just because I wanted to get them off of medicines. And so, you know, I, you know, I have put VNSs in in patients that have significant ADHD and they have to take two types of stimulants and they're on three seizure medicines. It's a lot of medicine. So putting in a VNS, reduce the seizures. We could be on one seizure medicine um, and then they could really concentrate more and feel less um, stress taking just their ADHD medicine and their once a day seizure medicine. Um, now, the selection of type is really different. Like these are all neur neuromodulation devices and so it's kind of hard to like talk about them all at the same time, but because they're so different in how they, they um, in, in a way in how they work and who they are best for, one patient, it, it may, one thing may work really well where the other one is just, there's not even, doesn't even make sense to try. Um, and then interestingly, someone asked this in an earlier session about having a VNS and potentially getting a DBS. Having one doesn't exclude you from having another. And so interestingly, I think 45% of the people who were in the DBS trial already had VNSs in. <laughs> and so, I mean, these are uh, potentially even complementary uh, um, devices that because they work slightly differently. And so, We've also had patients that had a VNS in, took it out, and then had the RNS placed. Um, and so this is something that I think we're gonna see more of over time because more patients are implanted, but we may also be able to predict who is, like which mod modulation device is best for which patient, and so maybe we'll see less doubling up, who knows. But um, so th I would love to have anybody um, ask questions or come up and be able to touch these devices and look at them and just keep it informal. So happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so based on EEG. So they'll look at things like uh, 
Um, the fast, the, you know, there are parts of the, the EG squiggles that are slow, and then there are times where they're very fast, and it's gonna look at like, how do those change in relation to each other? And so, you know, just looking at that, and they have some very sophisticated ways of doing that, um, which I don't understand, but they are really drilling down, and I think that, um, that knowledge base will get better over time yeah, as, we learn, as we have more patients in land with it. If you have a patient with ESES, what would be the best one of those four, three, four, whatever ones? So we don't know okay. is the right. answer. <laughs> but, uh, but I hate leaving it at that. But um, the, um, there are theories that in ESES, the thalamus is a key player because the thalamus is kind of a pacemaker for our brains. It's constantly just has this beat. And so when we fall asleep and our brain, our outer brain goes to sleep, we can actually see that thalamus coming through on the EG, just going, going. And so there is a theory that ESIS really does in, uh, involve the thalamus because it's so oscillatory and it really comes out in sleep. And so people, you know, we have talked about implanting the thalamus to see if we could prevent the ESIS. But in some people, that's not going to work. We do know a little bit about that. And so if we could know if the ESIS was focal, then we could put a CSCS or an RNS over that area, would that work? Now, the reason I'm excited about CSCS is exactly for that reason, it's ESIS. Because I think that there could be some application there. But it's going to take so many years to know. It's going to take so many years to know. Um, because ESIS is rare, and getting a neuromodulation device is two that can be connected to this. So there are two little connectors here. So now, oftentimes we put in four because we think we know the area, but we're not totally sure. So we implant four maybe here, for example, and we connect this one and this one. And then we go, okay, that's not working well. It's been like six months, a year, but we have these two others in this other location that we thought could be helpful, and then a skin incision is made and the other two are connected. So it saves you a whole other brain surgery. Yeah, so, and they are uh, working on a, a four lead system so that we can connect all four, so we'll see. <laughs> is the pain from these, in, is it like kind of like an IV poke or a little bit? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, so the RNS, I think, you know, this one is because they're taking out uh, this size of the skull, um, you know, we don't have pain endings in the brain, but we have them in the, in the outer part of the brain and the bag that holds our brain. And then we have them in the scalp. And so it's really the scalp pain. And so people do experience headache, but it's shockingly not as much as you would think. And so they, people tolerate this very well. Now, some people get an area of numbness because whenever you go into the scalp, you can cut little local nerves and make an area numb forever. So some people feel a little area of numbness. I had one patient that got a little more sensitive over her site where this was implanted, so it's always a risk. You know, it's always a risk. Did you have a question? I was gonna ask after you for the development, would the facility for you guys would be implanted? Because that's like the newer Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that so it's we really don't know the best way to do it yet. So So they're doing two, like typically yeah. two? Okay. Yeah, typically two and and there are different nuclei in the thalamus. Right. Um, and so depending on what seizures are occurring in, in that patient, we may put them in different parts of the thalamus. So but that's all still like needs to be trialed and like, explored more to see what it does. What's considered, like you know, you sent the DNS with a high heart rate, like what is it usually? What what numbers is it usually? So it's a it's a rise over baseline. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's like We'll say if it rises by 20% or more, um, and so we can actually change that um, that sensitivity to make it more or less sensitive. Um, you know, I, I had a girl who I would look at her trends and I'd be like, you know, every Friday night the VNS is really going off um, a lot. Like, and she's like, oh, I dance every Friday night. And so for, in her case, like it wasn't running from you know a dead stop to a sprint, but like 
she was getting extra stimulations on Friday, but her weekends were great. And so, so then I was like, maybe you need more stimulations. Like, we learned something here, you know? So it kind of allowed us to make some adjustments. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, like if you have a kid who's just sitting there and his heart rate is 115, 120, 125, 135, there's something wrong, right? Usually, or is that baseline for this it's, Yeah, right, so in this is, so the VNS only looks at like the baseline, it collects kind of baseline data before it decides how it's, when it's gonna give an extra stimulation. Yeah, so it's different for everybody, yeah. Okay. yeah. There are no other questions, you're welcome to come up and look at this stuff. <laughs>